Chapter twenty seven of From Bangkok to Bombay Siam, French Indochina, Burma, Hindustan by Frank G. Carpenter. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Jaipur and the Rajas. Imagine miles of pink houses laid out along checkerboard streets. Through the lattice work over the windows that jut out from the second stories, let dark eyes peep or here and there let nut-brown fingers loaded with rings clasp the woodwork. Seat on some of the balconies dark, turbaned men and richly dressed boys, beside them slender maidens with faces modestly covered by bright-colored scarfs. In the midst of the houses set a great enclosure in which are many pink palaces and their beautiful gardens, and erect about the whole a crenellated wall pierced by seven gateways. Now you have the outlines of my surroundings today in the rose-red city of Jaipur, capital of one of the most prosperous of the native states of northwest India. Jaipur is said to be the finest native capital of India, and it is one of the few cities of the Orient laid out on a regular plan. Its main thoroughfare is two miles long and 110 feet wide, and this is intersected by other streets of the same width with narrower ones crossing between them. The roads are as hard as stone and as smooth as a floor. All the plaster houses are painted pink, so that I feel in Jaipur almost as if I had strayed onto a stage set for a musical comedy. Under the balconies of the houses are tiny shops in which are merchants selling the thousand and one things used by the people. Moving along the streets is a throng of natives and their beasts here is a little caravan of gaunt camels ridden by bare-legged men in turbans who bob up and down as they rock on their way there is a camel ridden by a woman her bare legs ringed with anklets are astride the hump and one eye peeps out as she directs the driver where to lead her mount here is another camel carrying stones and going along with his lip hanging down pouting like a spoiled child up the street is an elephant. It belongs to the Raja, and its rider is one of the servants of the palace who is taking the beast out for exercise. There is a herd of donkeys, no bigger than Newfoundland dogs, and almost hidden under their heavy loads. Their drivers pound and yell at them as they urge them along without either bridle or rein. Here, too, are many humped bullocks, bearing on their backs panniers filled with hay stone or merchandise now and then arab horses come prancing by and as you look at them and their riders you have no doubt that there is wealth in jaipur what gorgeous costumes these native nobles wear enough gold embroidery to deck all the diplomats at a white house reception there are gold chains about their necks and their arms and fingers are heavy with jewels they have gold embroidered turbans and vests of cloth of gold their bridle bits are often of silver each sits straight in his saddle while the groom at his stirrup runs along shouting to the people to get out of the way the crowd on foot is as gay as that upon horseback here comes a party of singing girls dressed all in red and gold chanting strange songs as they dance through the streets their silver bracelets and anklets jingle as they move after them come Moslem maidens in short waists and garments like dirty red drawers that are wide at the waist but taper down into tights at the calves. They have a saucy way of walking, like their kind the world over. There are working women also. Some of them are mending the road, breaking stones or carrying the crushed rock in baskets on their heads. A corps of brown men in waistcloths, their skins glistening with sweat, or stamping the gravel into the roadbed, and as they do so, a water carrier sprinkles the crushed stone with a thin stream from his water bag. Everywhere in India one sees these men, watering the streets or peddling water from house to house. Their bottles are each made of the whole skin of a pig, and as they pass you feel as if you had stepped back into the days of the Bible. The best time to see Jaipur is in the evening, when the air is cold and the sinking sun flushes the pink buildings to a deeper rose. Then along the wide main street, 
booths are open and hundreds of merchants spread their wares upon the pavement here for a block only shoes are for sale and the turned-up slippers of the mohammedan and dainty footwear of satin embroidered in gold are set out to await buyers here are a score of brass merchants there a whole block is taken up with the fruit and vegetable sellers and in the side streets carpenters are sawing away walking through long aisles of hindus displaying the gaudiest cottons we come to a cashmere cloth merchant and haggle over a shawl his stock includes shawls worth thousands of rupees but some can be bought for a few dollars he asks for all of them three times what he expects to get and in case you object is willing to throw up a coin and let head or tail decide the bargain most american visitors buy shawls in this part of india and after a sale is made the merchant invariably demands that a recommendation be written in his notebook this he shows to other travelers and i find scattered over india the autographs of many of my prominent fellow countrymen at delhi i saw an autograph of a man so noted that the merchant who had it at the bottom of a statement that his wares were good told me that he had been offered one hundred rupees for it and that he would not sell it for one hundred thousand rupees over another well-known signature is the testimonial that the writer finds a certain man's shawls good and he supposes they are cheap the dealer at that stand tells me that this notable bought a dozen cashmere shawls saying he wanted to use them for making undershirts these were of the kind called ring shawls so fine that one can be pulled through a wedding ring it must be nice to have an undershirt so filmy and i can see the advantage of such a garment in the case of a man who travels with his extra clothing in his hat over all these traders and other residents of the city as well as over the more than two million souls in the state of which it is the capital the maharaja of jaipur has the power of life and death he lives in the pomp befitting such a potentate his palaces here cover acres and in his gardens are silvery fountains and peacocks spreading their gorgeous feathers as they strut in and out of the courtyards these courts are floored with marble over which are scattered persian rugs of great price in one of the palaces i saw a billiard room the floor of which was covered with the skin of tigers and leopards i passed from one to another of a series of small rooms filled with beautiful works of indian art carved ivory jeweled and inlaid caskets and enamel such as are only made in the state of jaipur i saw also the outside of the zenana where his highness keeps his numerous ladies and then took a look at the stables they are built around a space of six acres or more and are heavily roofed to keep off the sun the stalls are filled with fine stock there are stallions from arabia america and europe as well as some from different parts of india the maharaja has besides a dozen or more state elephants for use on ceremonial occasions some are of enormous size their tusks have been cut off and the ends bound with brass rings these beasts are tattooed on their foreheads and ears in the patterns of a shawl when they are brought out for the ruler they are covered with fancy trappings and have brass chains around their necks on my first visit to india i accepted the invitation of the secretary of the maharaja to ride to the ruined city of amber upon one of the royal elephants he was brought around for me shortly before noon and at the command of the hindu driver sitting on his head he knelt down so that i might mount to his back i scrambled up a step-ladder into a cushioned saddle with bars around the sides and the driver showed me how to hold on while the huge creature lumbered to his feet he raised himself upon one leg at a time and i bobbed back and forth like a ship in a storm after we started the motion was a swaying this way and that and i became half seasick as we wound our way up the mountains in front of me was the driver with his brown legs clasped over the elephant's neck just back of the big flapping ears with a sharp steel hook he stirred up the great beast and now and then made him trot after a time i got used to the motion and when we were out in the country and climbing the hills 
i began to enjoy my strange ride i had to watch out however for every now and then something made the elephant shy at one place a monkey ran across the road and a long-tailed ape jumped through the branches just over our heads whereupon my beast swerved and almost threw me out of my seat at other places we saw wild peacocks and among the trees wild hogs were feeding by and by we came to the ruined city of amber which long ago was the capital of jaipur it was once a magnificent city with fine residences big business quarters and temples and palaces but one of the rajahs of the past became dissatisfied with his surroundings and decreed that the capital should be moved down to the plains amber is now quite deserted and the monkeys play in its ruins the present maharajah succeeded to the throne only recently i do not know what he is worth but he certainly has money to burn when on one occasion his predecessor went to england he is said to have spent a million dollars on the journey besides giving away something like a half million dollars in charities during that trip he chartered a special steamer which was fitted up with six different kitchens to comply with the varying caste requirements of his retinue he took with him his own drinking water from the ganges and had a little temple built on the ship where he worshipped rama his divine ancestor in his train were priests servants of all kinds several wives and a troop of notch girls and when he reached london his cortege filled to overflowing the palace that the government allotted to him indeed the wealth of some of these native princes seems fabulous in every jewelry store in the cities of india one finds flashy jewelry set with diamonds worth a fortune at calcutta i saw two amazing rings one had a diamond of about the size of a hickory nut set around with a cluster of small diamonds as big as peas and the whole was affixed to a finger ring containing enough gold to make a hunting case watch in the other the central stone was a ruby fully as big as a chestnut and the diamonds about it were very beautiful the settings of these rings were larger around than a twenty-five cent piece and i asked the jeweler who would wear such gorgeous and unwieldy objects he replied oh we sell these to the rajahs they want the most extravagant jewelry and some of them fairly cover themselves with gems the treasure of the cake war of baroda includes gun carriages and cannon of gold and silver containing two hundred and eighty pounds of precious metal apiece in state processions these are drawn by white bullocks covered with gold embroidered trappings and with horns encased in silver in this collection also is a great necklace containing the sixth largest diamond in the world and three pearls said to be valued at one hundred thousand dollars the richest of all the princes is the nizam of hyderabad whose revenues are about fifteen million dollars a year his palaces are enormous and he has seven thousand retainers and servants his courtyards full of elephants camels and horses remind one of a page from the arabian nights the country ruled by the nizam is more than twice as large as the state of ohio he is a mohammedan but the bulk of his thirteen million subjects are hindus his collection of jewels is said to be worth thirty million dollars he has the nizam diamond one of the finest stones of its kind and in his realm is golconda the diamond producing center of the past there is a story that on one occasion the late nizam of hyderabad was walking with his small son who expressed a desire for a red-tailed nightingale he saw on another small boy's wrists the nizam turned to one of his courtiers go buy that bird for seven hundred rupees said he seven hundred rupees exclaimed the courtier why your highness could get it for a sixteenth of that sum his exalted highness frowned indeed said he go pay the boy seven thousand rupees and bring me the nightingale and the receipt another prince who has magnificent jewels and who lives in great state is the maharana of udaipur whose ancestors refused to mingle their blood even with that of a mohammedan emperor he claims to have the bluest blood of any of the native rulers and clings to all the old customs 
progressive rulers like those of jaipur baroda mysore and gwalior have spent their revenues on improving their domains but udapur has no use for such modern ideas he is an ultra conservative speaks no english and never leaves india on one occasion he heard that at a great durbar or official gathering to which he was invited the viceroy was to ride at the head of the procession with his wife on an elephant beside him udapur declined to attend for he would not lower himself by riding behind a woman indeed he sent a richly caparisoned elephant to walk in his place in line because of his traditional descent from the sun god himself the maharana of udapur claims to outrank every human being in india but the nizam of hyderabad by virtue of having the most extensive territory the biggest income and the largest army of any native prince claims that he is the premier native ruler when king george v and queen mary came to delhi just after their coronation the nizam asserted his right to lead the grand procession of princes which was to file past their majesties udapur declared that if he had to follow the nizam he would not come the situation was delicate for the british cannot afford to offend the sensitive feelings of the more powerful of the native princes finally both the rulers claims were satisfied the nizam led the procession but udapur as personal aide-de-camp to king george stood on the dais beside the king emperor while the other princes of india passed in review the man who thought of this happy solution was knighted the native states of india are scattered all over the country from kashmir and nepal in the himalayas to the southern end of hindustan the princes and rajahs are supposed by the common people to have absolute power but they are all to some extent under the control of the british and all have british advisers at their elbows these princes may not make war or peace or send ambassadors to each other or to outside states they are permitted to keep limited military forces as police or for cooperation with the british governor but even the nizam has only sixteen thousand soldiers no european may reside at any of their courts without the sanction of the government and in case of outrageous misrule the british can come in and take charge some few of the native states pay a cash tribute leading states such as hyderabad mysore baroda and kashmir are in direct relations with the government of british india while others are grouped under the direction of agents of the viceroy sometimes for misconduct a ruler is deposed by the british or he may lose his title of maharaja or the number of guns accorded him in salute may be cut down every rajah is extremely jealous of his quota of guns one with a salute of less than nine guns may not be addressed as your highness it must gall the haughty udapur to have to get along with only nineteen guns while the rulers of gwalior hyderabad baroda kashmir and mysore are twenty-one gun rajahs while many of the native rulers are extremely backward and some like the maharao of kutch boast that they spend nothing on public improvements others are notably progressive the late baroda was tireless in his efforts to better conditions the maharajas of gwalior and of mysore are leaders of progress the latter has hired experts some of them americans to help him with his various projects such as a great hydroelectric plant a blast furnace cotton and woolen mills and irrigation works he has granted his people representative institutions and indians claim that mysore is as well administered as british india itself bangalore the capital city has such fine sanitation that it is practically plague proof yet this ruler is not a university graduate has never been out of india and is a fanatical hindu quite a number of the reigning princes of india have been educated abroad at paris or in england or even in the united states the late gekwara baroda sent his son to harvard the british virtually obliged the rajahs to send their sons to one of the four princes colleges which are situated at lahore ajmer rajkot and indore 
the most important of these is mayo college at ajmer less than one hundred miles south of jaipur it is managed by a committee of native rulers and was founded in eighteen seventy three by lord mayo especially for the noble youth of rajputana in the united states the college would rank as a preparatory school with the standing of say andover or exeter after completing the regular course a young man may take postgraduate work in the same institution equivalent to university training with us the teaching is in english hindi urdu sanskrit and persian i was interested to learn that as taught at mayo the multiplication table does not stop at twelve times twelve but with twenty five times twenty five some of the two hundred young princes in attendance are under the care of tutors and all are allowed one servant while some are granted more some of the wealthy ones have their own automobiles athletic exercise is compulsory and the masters try to inculcate the ideals of such british schools as eton and rugby when the east india company began expanding its scope in hindustan the states under native rulers came gradually under british influence and the princes were usually confirmed in their possessions this policy was more or less abandoned not long before the mutiny of eighteen fifty seven and in the regime of lord dalhousie either because of failure of heirs or because of gross misrule some of the states fell into the hands of the company but when following the mutiny the british crown took over the management of british territory in india queen victoria made a pledge to the indian princes that they should be protected in their rights and dignity and that the integrity of their domains should be preserved so now when the nationalist agitators declare that the rajahs are bloodsuckers fattening on the poor and demand their deposition the british feel bound to protect the rulers from aggression this is probably the main reason why the rajahs have remained loyal to the british during all the unrest of the last fifteen or twenty years End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of from bangkok to bombay siam french indochina burma hindustan by frank g carpenter this recording is in the public domain recorded by betty b bombay western gateway of india i made the seven hundred mile journey from jaipur to bombay in less than twenty-four hours yet in that short time i seemed to have been transported from one world to another Jaipur, with its wide streets of rose-colored houses, appeared to be dreaming away under the strong sunlight, unmindful of time and change. At Bombay, I am in the industrial capital of Hindustan. The smoke of factory chimneys streams across its skies, and ships from the four corners of the earth throng its port. Its position in relation to the other big centers for sea trade its harbor and cotton have made bombay a world port and a halfway station for all voyagers around the globe via the suez canal it is nearer new york and london than is calcutta on the opposite side of the indian peninsula hence the bulk of our trade with india as well as a large part of great britain's is handled through this entrance on the western coast of the country sixty per cent of bombay's trade is with england about twelve per cent is with japan and about ten per cent with us we buy here such raw products as manganese for our steel and shellac for our varnish and ship in iron and steel machinery dye stuffs and paper some of our big industrial concerns such as sewing machine typewriter oil and automobile firms have their indian headquarters at bombay there is quite a colony of Europeans and Americans, and their activities lend an atmosphere of Western push and energy to this city of the Orient. Near to, or in easy reach of Bombay, over excellent trunk lines of railway, are the main cotton-growing areas of India, the third largest cotton producer in the world. For many years, thousands of bales have been pouring through this sea gate to the mills of Manchester and Japan, and coming back again as cheap cotton cloth 
for india's millions while the growth of textile and other industries in the city itself has led to large imports of machinery and other manufactured goods bombay has one of the finest open harbors in the far east and the demand for factory workers has made wages in the bombay district so much higher than those in other ports of india that it pays here to use the most improved cargo handling machinery instead of human muscle the port trust has built excellent docks with ample accommodations and modern equipment for the endless procession of vessels coming into or leaving its piers like new york bombay lies on an island this is twelve miles long but very narrow and is connected with the mainland by a causeway like boston the city has its back bay it lies between the two points colaba and malabar hill along this bay and fronting on the esplanade road are the handsome public buildings that make bombay so imposing to passengers on the incoming steamers architecturally there is a considerable mixture of style and ornate decoration in the public offices yet the effect of the whole is certainly impressive along the shore of the bay runs queen's road a fine boulevard leading out to residential quarters of the wealthy on malabar hill right on the point is the residence of the governor of the presidency who with the governor of madras ranks next to the viceroy himself i am staying at the taj mahal hotel across Kalaba point from back bay it is a huge building placed where it will catch any breeze that comes in from the sea the rooms are as big and airy i suppose as they can be but my quarters like all bombay are hot 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 at any rate there are electric fans everywhere and the air circulates freely the big windows have no curtains they would be too smothery in this heat the floors are cool tiles outside my door is a little recess where my servant sleeps when i want him i clap my hands and he is here in a moment this afternoon when the heat has moderated i shall go out on the streets and join the crowds once more the street scenes of this great meeting place of the eastern world never lose their fascination for me here are arab traders chinese japanese malays negroes besides all the various peoples of india afghans and sikhs from northern hindustan rajputs bengalis marathas and many others there is color on all sides the men and women wear orange pink blue saffron brown purple and red even the native carts are of bright hues and the horns of the small white bullocks drawing them are gaily painted every one must have some kind of head covering as a protection against the sun and there are turbans caps and hats of every cut and color one man says that at the races here he once counted fifty odd different kinds of headgear in the crowd most noticeable of all are the glazed oil-rich hats of the parsees which look somewhat like one of our high silk hats without any brim among the parsees by the way are the prettiest women of all india they are slender and well formed and have clear olive brown skins beautiful eyes and fine intellectual faces their dress consists of one large piece of silk called a sari gracefully draped around the body and carried up over the top of the head so that the face is framed in the soft folds many of them i note have silk stockings and slippers to match the color of their draperies most of the young parsee girls dress like europeans except that they wear red caps embroidered in gold thread in the teens they adopt the sari which is always worn by the orthodox parsee women in india though some may put on french hats and gowns when traveling abroad some of their saris are beautiful and one may cost more than a thousand dollars many of them are made in the town of surat where hand weaving and printing silks are the chief home industries though the parsee men are often rather fine looking their hideous hats and their preacher-like coats keep them from seeming as attractive as the women when one drives along the queen's road and sees the fine public buildings facing back bay when he goes up to malabar hill with its houses set in ample grounds or when he sits drinking tea 
on the terrace of the yacht club overlooking the harbor it is hard to realize how the other half lives in bombay indeed not a half but more than three-fourths of the people of the city are huddled into wretched hovels with scarcely room to breathe most of the more than a million inhabitants of bombay are crowded into an area of about eleven square miles the town grew up haphazard without regard to street planning or sanitation the landlords bent on getting the last cent they could from their properties put up five and six-story tenements consisting of mere nests of rooms with but little attention to ventilation and light no wonder bombay has had a long history of terrible plagues in which tens of thousands have died like flies nor that of every thousand babies born here six hundred and sixty six do not live through their first year it is estimated that ninety nine per cent of the working class families dwell in one room tenements and according to a recent census there is only one building for every twenty two persons in a single room twelve by fifteen feet there were found living six families a total of thirty adults and children to remedy such conditions the bombay improvement trust was formed some years ago this body has done much for better sanitation and is now embarked on a large enterprise for housing the industrial workers thousands of the people who live in the overcrowded tenements are employed in bombay's cotton mills of the two million persons employed in all the factories of india a little more than six hundred thousand work in textile mills of one kind or another jute mills carpet and rug weaving plants silk mills and cotton mills by far the greater number of these textile workers are in the cotton mills and of the two hundred and eighty one such factories in the indian empire one hundred and eighty three are situated in bombay or its suburbs these employ nearly a quarter of a million natives cotton has been raised in india for centuries and has been manufactured here for more than a hundred years but it was our civil war that gave the industry its first big growth when england could not get cotton from our southern states she turned to india in four years the value of the cotton export increased twelve hundred per cent and bombay enjoyed a great boom peace in the united states caused a great slump here in which many fortunes were lost but for the last thirty or forty years the indian cotton industry has steadily grown the exports of raw cotton now amount to more than two hundred million dollars worth a year while manufacturing has been so developed that india now makes a considerable part of the cotton goods she requires she still imports however about two hundred thirty four million dollars worth of cotton manufactures including twist and yarn with more than three hundred million people all wearing cotton the home market for india's textiles is enormous just over the way is china with four hundred thirty million who also wear cottons and there is in addition a big market in africa indian labor though cheap is in many respects not so satisfactory as that available in japan and it is far less efficient than that of english and american mills the factory workers of hindustan are underfed and have been for years discipline is difficult for instance while the workers come early to the factories in many instances they knock off for the breakfast brought them from their homes any time between nine and eleven in the morning whenever the spirit moves them they stop for a smoke or a chat in some mills the children come along with their mothers and play around the machines in odd corners one may run across babies swung to cross beams in coarse hammocks and at any minute their mothers may leave their work to attend to infantile demands often too the native factory hand retains an interest in a bit of land back in his home village and at sowing and harvest times or in the wedding season in june off he goes perhaps staying for months before coming back to the factory in the bombay cotton mills the proportion of absenteeism sometimes amounts to as much as seventeen per cent the natives seem unable to manipulate anything except the simpler machinery the majority of the machine weavers of india handle two looms whereas i am told that in england 
it is rare to find a weaver who cannot manage from eight to twelve looms of the same kind as those in use in the bombay mills it seems to be the general opinion here that it takes from four to six indians to do the work of one american it is therefore a question whether or not the native labor of india is really so cheap after all the employers complain of the high wages they are higher than they were before the world war just as living costs are higher yet they certainly would not be considered exorbitant with us the average daily earning of a man in the bombay cotton mills is under forty five cents while the women receive about twenty five cents a weaver tending two looms gets sixty three cents a day while a man looking after but one may be paid thirty three cents the monthly income of an average working-class family in bombay consisting of a man his wife and two children is a little more than fourteen dollars of which nearly seventy per cent must be spent on food alone one of the first acts of the indian legislature was to pass a factory law reducing the maximum working hours from seventy to sixty in a week and prohibiting night work for women it also set the minimum age for employment of children at twelve years this measure was based on the recommendations of the first international labor conference held at washington in nineteen nineteen and marked a big step forward in improving the condition of the mill workers of india many of the mill owners have grown enormously wealthy i heard of the president of one of the big mills apologizing at a director's meeting for the fact that in the year covered by his report the business was paying only forty two per cent dividends such big dividends are not being realized today yet i understand that the indian mills are quite able to compete with those of england germany and japan and still earn handsome profits on their capital the terrible poverty of india is not confined either to her farmers or her factory workers this morning i had an illustration of how still another class feels its pinch i was waiting at the post office to register a letter when i heard a quarrel going on among the clerks the noise was so great that i went to the window and looked in i saw there a big fine-looking babu or native petty official dressed in a long white coat and gold turban cursing a lean hindu in a cheap garb of white cotton the babu shook both his fists in the little man's face and denounced his ancestors to the seventh generation the little fellow protested and apologized but the babu only cursed him the louder and ended by shoving him back to his place at the sorting table when i asked what the matter was the weighing clerk whispered the mail is late and that clerk is partly the cause it is not his fault though he is poor and has not had enough to eat hungry men cannot work fast that man gets only fifteen rupees five dollars a month and one cannot buy much rice for that it used to be better but things are so high now that the poor have not enough the incident together with what i had been hearing of wages and conditions among the factory people here gave me food for thought on the whole i am not surprised that there are numerous strikes in bombay or that this city at once so prosperous and so poverty-stricken should be a centre of unrest i was diverted a moment ago from such depressing reflections as these by the sound of a flute beneath my window stopping my writing i looked out to see an indian juggler on the pavement below i tossed him a few annas so that he would go through his tricks he gave his performance on the pavement without table cabinet or any of the paraphernalia of the american wizard his equipment consisted of three small baskets ranging in size from half a peck to a bushel a couple of cloths and a tripod of sticks three little wooden dolls with red cloths tied around their necks represented the gods that enabled him to do wonderful things he was black-faced and black-bearded and like all magicians had his shirt sleeves pulled up above his elbows his only assistant was a little turbaned boy he performed first the basket trick of india one of the most noted juggling feats of the world the boy's hands were bound and he was put into a net which was tied over his head and enclosed his whole body so that apparently he could not move 
he was then crowded into a basket two feet square and the lid was closed and strapped down the juggler took up a sword and made a few passes over it with the doll gods muttering incantations as he did so then he thrust his sword again and again into the basket and it came out red there was a crying as though a child were in terrible pain i held my breath and felt like pouncing on the man though i knew it was only a trick after a moment the cries ceased the juggler made a few more passes unbuckled the straps and showed that the basket was empty he called baba baba and in the distance i heard the child's voice how the boy got out of the basket or escaped being killed by the sword and where the blood came from i do not know the tripod was used for the mango trick first the juggler poured water over a little pot of earth next he held up a mango seed about the size of a walnut and putting this into the earth he threw a cloth over the tripod and the pot he blew on his flute made mysterious passes and after a few moments raised the cloth there was a mango tree sprouting from the soil more passes and more music followed and the cloth was pulled down again after a few moments he drew out the pot and the plant had grown about a foot further watering and longer incantations and his final triumph came in revealing a bush nearly a yard high and covered with leaves uprooting this he showed me the seed at the bottom the other day i saw a juggler do the snake trick asking me to hold out my hand the man laid a piece of paper upon it he then began playing his flute and staring as if he saw something near my hand he danced around me like a wizard playing all the time and keeping his eyes on my palm now he started back and pointed to it i saw nothing and he only played louder and danced more wildly suddenly he dropped the flute but continued his dance chanting as he whirled he pointed to the paper again and then swiftly clapped his hand down upon it and pulled up three great snakes which raised their hooded heads darted out their tongues and squirmed and wiggled as he held them up before me i started back for they were the deadly cobras there were four other people with me and we tried our best to ascertain how the thing was done one of our party stood upon a chair and overlooked the juggler as he snatched up the snakes but could not see where they came from i only know that he had them and that they were so big that it was with difficulty that he crowded them into a little round basket the size of a peck measure end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of from bangkok to bombay siam french indochina burma hindustan by frank g carpenter this recording is in the public domain recorded by betty b the towers of silence on malabar hill on malabar hill five miles away from downtown bombay are the finest homes of the city the britisher living in india wants nothing better than a bungalow on this palm-clad ridge cooled by the winds from the arabian sea and yet the blue sky overhead is full of vultures and any morning he may find on his veranda the finger bone of a baby or a man's big toe which some carrion bird has dropped there in its flight for here also are the parsee towers of silence upon which the fire worshippers of india lay the naked bodies of their dead to be eaten by the fowls of the air of all the religions of this land of religions it seems to me that in many respects the faith of these parsees is the strangest their name meaning persians is derived from the fact that in the eighth century they fled from persia which was then overrun by the conquering moslem arabs and came down to san han about sixty miles north of bombay here they were kindly received by the hindus from their home country they brought the beliefs of zoroaster to which with modifications they have clung ever since zoroastrianism was the religion of the wise men who followed the star to the stable where christ was born at bethlehem five hundred years before that it was the guiding belief of cyrus the great of persia when jerusalem was taken by nebuchadnezzar 
Zoroaster was a boy of twelve. He lived in northern Persia, and the old Persian writings chronicle many miracles of his birth and life. After a period of preparation, he received at thirty a spiritual revelation of the one God, and came forth to reform the ancient creed of Persia. He was tempted again and again by the spirit of darkness, but always came off triumphant. His teachings spread all over Persia, where they were supreme until the Mohammedans suppressed them by persecution. A white-haired, silver-bearded old Parsee here at Bombay tells me that one of the chief elements of Zoroastrianism is a conviction that the soul is immortal and that all human beings are free moral agents, and therefore responsible. The Parsees believe in rewards and punishments, and that in this life we settle our future existence. As to the Parsi God, he is called the Doer, the Creator and the Governor of the world. He is the emblem of light, and for this reason, when the Parsi worships, he stands before the sacred flame, or turns his face to the sun, as the symbol of the Almighty. We have often heard the Parsis called worshippers of fire. In a sense, this is correct, for they have fire always burning in their temples, but they worship it, as one of them told me, only as an emblem of the sun, the source of all life, and hence the visible representation of God. The fire in the temples at Bombay is said to have been kept alive for hundreds of years. The hallowed flame was brought from the altars of Persia, where it was first lighted centuries before the Mohammedans conquered that country. With it, the Parsis kindled their altars at Senhan, and later still they brought it with them to Bombay. Strangers are not permitted to see this fire. The Parsis regard their worship as too sacred to be viewed by outsiders, and they make no display of gorgeous churches or elaborate ceremonies. In some of their new temples, they have started the fires by coals from a tree or buildings struck by lightning, and have fed them with chips and dust of sandalwood. I understand that they will not spit in a fire or blow out a light. For a long time, many of them would not smoke tobacco, and some of the most orthodox have refused to serve in the fire department, not wishing to sin by putting out fires. This worship of fire is by no means original with the Parsees. Our own ancestors of the long ago were worshippers of fire as representing the lightning and the sun. The Hindus had a fire god called Agni and bowed down to it as a means of purification. Sacred fire is a feature of many of their domestic rites today, and at their weddings, the bride and groom walk around a fire lighted by a priest. The Grand Mogul, Akbar, made his own holy flame by igniting a piece of cotton by the rays of the sun shining through a crystal lens, and all the fires of his household were started in that way. The Parsi method of disposing of their dead is an outgrowth of their reverence for fire. Fire is too consecrated to be defiled with a corpse. By the tenets of Zoroaster, not only fire, but earth and water also must never be thus polluted. So the Parsis lay the bodies of their dead on towers out under the sky and the vultures pick them to the bone. Malabar Hill, where the Towers of Silence stand, rises almost straight up from the sea. The place of the dead is covered with a beautiful garden, and you walk up to it over well-paved roads shaded by tropical trees and bordered with flowers and shrubs. Winding through this luxuriant vegetation, you reach at last a point from whence you can see far out over the Arabian Sea, and turning landward, can view the whole of Bombay. Here among the trees at one side, shut off by an iron railing so that none but the priests may enter, are five circular towers as white as the bones that lie on their tops. Each tower is about 25 feet in height and 90 feet in diameter. It is crowned with a grating which slopes toward the center, where there is a well connected by drains with the sea. A small tower is reserved for the bodies of suicides. In each tower there are certain divisions for the different classes of the dead. One section is devoted to the bodies of men, another to those of women, and a third, the part nearest the well, to
to the corpse of children the bodies are carried into the towers by two bearded men dressed all in white and known as the carriers of the dead at every funeral they take their remains and entering the tower walk up a flight of steps and place the naked corpse in its proper section after the flesh has been devoured by the birds which do their gruesome work in less than an hour the skeleton is left to bleach in the hot sun when the bones are dry the carriers of the dead take tongs and throw them into the well where they are left to crumble to dust these towers are well drained the heavy rains of the tropics fall upon them but the water goes off into the sea and there are filters below them filled with charcoal so that all is kept clean indeed the bone dust accumulates so slowly that it has taken forty years to cover the bottom to a depth of five feet there is absolutely no bad odor about this strange cemetery i shall never forget my visit to the towers of silence none but the parsees are supposed to go close to them and it was through a parsee of high rank that i gained admittance to the enclosure with one of the sextons i made my way about through the paths of a park comprising perhaps sixty acres of trees and flowers i was shown the parsee temple and then taken to a place where i could get a view of the towers each seemed to me a huge cylinder of white with a frieze or coping of big black birds as i watched the birds sprang into life they raised their heads and craned their necks and i thought they must imagine us corpse bearers a moment later a funeral made its way up the hill and i saw that the vultures were gazing at it in front came the two carriers of the dead bearing upon their shoulders the body of a baby which was clad in white the carriers had their faces covered and behind them came mourners in white clothing all parsees walk to their funerals which are the same for every class and condition naked we came into the world and naked we must depart from it said my old parsee guide the bones of us all go into these reservoirs and the flesh of rich and poor feed the same vultures as the procession drew near the birds grew excited they flapped their wings and flew from one side of the tower to the other because of the slope of the grating i could not see the little body as it was stripped and laid in its place such sights are visible only to the carriers but i could tell when it was exposed by the flapping of the wings of the vultures as they hurried over to the tower the sight was a horrible one but after all is this so much worse than our way of disposing of the dead there is a movement among the more advanced of the parsees to give up this practice which has prevailed among them for centuries they do not regard applied electricity as fire and i understand that at least some of them have been negotiating with an american company for the purchase of an electric crematory i am sure such an invention will be viewed with horror by the strictest of the parsees the parsee sect is managed by a panchayat or council of elders which controls more property than trinity church in new york it has charge of all the church funds amounting to more than two million dollars and real estate holdings of great value the parsees are conservative and want to keep out of the fold converts not of pure parsee blood for example the french wife of a member of a millionaire parsee family became converted to her husband's religion and was received into the membership thereupon the bigots of the faith objected and the trustees of the punchiat decided that converts might not worship in the parsee temples or be laid in the towers of silence to have their flesh torn from their bodies by the vultures the french lady stood upon her rights bringing suit in the courts of bombay to enforce them the judges decided in her favor and converts now come into the church under certain restrictions one of the justices suggested that the outsiders might have separate temples and towers and another protested that the verdict might open the church to undesirables and ruin the prosperity of the parsi community there are only a little more than a hundred thousand of the parsis but they are a rich and powerful class four-fifths of them are in the bombay presidency while the rest are scattered throughout india 
their combined wealth aggregates untold millions they are the financial kings of india and have to be considered in every big business undertaking in the country they are noted for both their integrity and their progressiveness and just now when india is stirred up by the nationalists the fact that they stand by the government is of immense importance to great britain the parsees are well educated and many of them are graduates of colleges and universities they maintain large schools for boys and girls at bombay and other places in hindustan for the education not only of their own children but of those of other creeds if they care to attend one of the finest institutions in india is the science institute at bangalore in the native state of mysore which was founded by a wealthy parsee to provide scientific training for young people charity appears to be the very essence of the parsee religion from one end to the other india swarms with beggars but not one of the mendicants is a parsee the whole sect would consider itself disgraced if one of their number should be reduced to begging they give largely to public enterprises and have spent millions on institutions for their own people for instance when one of the families of wadius died his bequests for the amelioration of the condition of the poor and the promotion of education among the parsees amounted to more than five million dollars i drove today past the jam set g g g boy institute founded seventy-five years ago by a parsee of that name he began life as a poor boy and died worth ten million dollars a great part of which went to charity he gave five million dollars to hospitals colleges and rest houses and about one hundred thousand to the school the government of india took charge of the gift and agreed to pay six per cent upon it as a loan since then other parsees have added to the endowment and the capital of the institute is many times as large as when it was opened the parsees of bombay are building sanitary houses for the poor of their communities from which they expect only enough rent to get four per cent on their investment such charities are not confined to the men rich parsee widows have made gifts that compare with those of mrs russell sage and there are parsee women whose generosity ranks with that of helen gould shepherd for example one of the women of the petite family gave jewelry valued at nearly half a million dollars to found a girl's orphanage one of the parsee givers of the past whom we might compare with certain of our millionaire widows was motley by wadia who gave away a million and a half dollars in public charities and almost two millions in private alms and who built bombay's first hospital or native women notwithstanding these gifts she left a big fortune to her descendants the parsees are much europeanized and mingle with the british and the society of bombay their women are not and have never been secluded but go about just as freely as do our western wives and daughters and have quite as dignified a position in their homes end of chapter twenty nine Chapter 30 of From Bangkok to Bombay, Siam, French Indochina, Burma, Hindustan by Frank G. Carpenter. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Indian Captains of Industry. I have just had a chat with one of the most progressive millionaires of all Asia. I refer to Sir Dorabji Tata, the head of the rich Tata family and senior member of the Bombay firm of Tata Sons Limited. The Tatas own the Taj Mahal Hotel, the biggest in the Far East, and one of the most uncomfortable. They hold the majority of stock in the largest cotton mills of India. They have undertaken the greatest hydroelectric development in the country, and they run an iron and steel works employing more than 25,000 men. The Tata family is to Hindustan, what the Mitsuis are to Japan, the Rothschilds to Europe, or the Morgans to the United States. They are millionaires who make their money breed like Australian rabbits, and Midases whose touch seems to turn all things to gold. Their ancestors were priests of Zoroaster, 
and are supposed to have descended from the ancient kings of persia the tatas were driven out of that country with the other parsees and in india they drifted away from the priesthood and went into trade at the time of our civil war the great-grandfather of the present head of the family was a government contractor in his day he made and lost several fortunes and gave large sums to charity and the support of his religion jamsetji nusserwanji tata the grandfather of the man with whom i talk today came to bombay as a boy and engaged in general trading he made money and invested in some of india's first cotton mills and later on established spinning and weaving plants that revolutionized cotton manufacturing in india he built mills not only at bombay but in different parts of the interior and handled them so well that the stockholders got a large return on their money every year as well as stock dividends aggregating millions from the earnings of one mill he paid back in profits more than thirteen times the original capital and he founded other enterprises equally successful this man became a multimillionaire, and when he died he had interests in all parts of india as well as in england and in china japan and other countries of the orient the scheme for furnishing hydroelectric power to the cotton mills of bombay originated with j n tata though it was put through by his son and grandsons this development which is constantly undergoing expansion is in some respects one of the biggest water power undertakings of the world its success is due largely to the western ghats hills that rise two thousand feet above sea level within a short distance of the arabian sea when the monsoon winds sweep inland from the ocean the mountains force them to break into tremendous rains while the tablelands behind the range form an ideal catchment area at the suggestion of an englishman david gosling mr tata got foreign experts to investigate the possibilities of a water power project this they did for six long years during which both tata and gosling died but the tata heirs continued with the plan formed a syndicate and at last got the scheme under way now the rainfall stored in three lakes in the hills furnishes hydroelectric energy for lighting bombay and running her mills and streetcars the development was carried on largely by american engineers and the american formerly in charge is now a partner in the tata firm most important perhaps among all of the enterprises mentioned is the tata iron and steel company i learned something of it in my interview with sir dorab g tata in his bombay office the steel works are situated at jamshedpur about one hundred and fifty miles from calcutta and not far from beds of iron ore and coal the plant was built by an american engineering firm of new york and today some fifty of the most important executives are americans the tata company is one of the largest iron and steel corporations of asia and its future appears almost unlimited india now consumes something like seven hundred thousand tons of steel every year much of which is imported it annually buys about fifty million dollars worth of railway steel and rolling stock as well as machinery hardware and tools to the amount of more than a hundred ten million dollars the government requirements alone are enormous it operates eighty-seven large railway shops and arsenals and dockyards employing altogether more than one hundred thousand men all of these works feed on iron and steel in addition factories are now springing up in india and they all need machinery besides the cotton mills there are jute mills sugar mills and iron and brass foundries at present great britain furnishes about all the machinery and mill equipment most of the railway materials and the greater part of the iron and steel but it seems certain that india will ultimately do far more of her own iron and steel manufacturing thus providing employment for thousands of natives and increasing the wealth and prosperity of the country as it is now the tata plant which employs more than twenty five thousand men is the biggest single enterprise in all india 
and the only plant-making steel. But it cannot yet meet India's requirements in steel rails, let alone supply the demand for other steel products. In fact, the combined output of the Tata plant and all other Indian ironworks can take care of only a part of the available market. Consequently, there is plenty of room for expansion. I asked Sir Dorab G. Tata to give me the history of the beginning of the enterprise at Jamshedpur, said he. Of course, we investigated thoroughly before building the steelworks. My father, you know, originated the idea. He took it up some years ago with the hope of making this a great manufacturing nation. After some study of England, he concluded that her industrial strength came from the development of her iron and coal. To find out whether India had similar resources, he hired prospectors to go all over the peninsula. They found at last certain deposits that he thought might be used for pig iron. The available coal, however, was of a low grade and needed special treatment to fit it for coking. He offered prizes for the invention of suitable processes, and when they were developed, he proposed to the government that it grant him concessions for starting the industry. But he could get no satisfaction and was forced to drop the matter. Twenty years later, he succeeded in interesting Lord George Hamilton, then Secretary of State for India. Lord George declared that the government would be glad to aid him in such an undertaking, and so my father began his investigations anew, spending a hundred thousand dollars or more upon them in the last years of his life. We continued the work. What did you find? I asked. Much that no one imagined existed, was the reply. The geological survey had mentioned several iron deposits. We reprospected the places designated until we had located deposits large enough for our purpose. My father went himself to the United States, where he engaged mining experts to come out and tell us whether it would pay to work the mines. The first deposits we examined were not far from Nagpur, and upon our arrival at that place, we went into the Mineral Museum. As we looked at the specimens there, one of our American mining engineers observed some fine ore labeled with the location of the deposit. We sent to the place and discovered there two great hills of almost solid iron. The ore was between 65 and 70 percent pure, superior to the best of your ores and the equal of almost any in the world. We reported this to the government geologists who claimed there must be a mistake. So they sent out their own investigators who stated that the iron was even better than we had represented. At the same time, continued Mr. Tata, we discovered deposits of good coking coal not far away, as well as limestone and the other essentials for making steel, and obtained concessions for the various deposits. The results you know. Sir Dorabji and a few other Parsees tried to get British capital interested in their scheme, but London's shekels were not forthcoming, and finally the Parsees turned to their own countrymen. No such appeal for capital had ever been made in India before, but the native princes and men of wealth responded at once with ample funds, and from that day to this all the capital required by the company as it has expanded has come out of Indian pockets. The Jamshedpur plant was opened for business just on the eve of the World War, and furnished steel rails for the military railways not only in Mesopotamia, but in Egypt, Palestine, and East Africa. Twelve years after the first stake was driven to the iron and steel town at Jamshedpur, its population numbered close to 100,000. The Tatas are making a model industrial center of their city, the planning of which was entrusted to an Englishman. Another Englishman serves as a kind of city manager, but for the most part Indians are employed where they can do the work. There are only about 200 positions in the plant held by British or Americans who are needed as supervisors of the furnaces and rolling mills and in positions where special executive or mechanical abilities are required. Educated Bengalis and Madrasas, many of them Brahmins, 
are chiefly engaged in clerical, technical, and managerial work. Moslems from the Punjab, Pathans from the northwest border, and Sikhs are trained to do skilled manual labor. The bulk of the unskilled workers are Santals, the sun-worshipping aboriginal inhabitants of the region, who as a rule are industrious and cheerful, though extremely ignorant and liable to violent outbursts of passion. Your works should succeed the better on account of the Swadeshi movement, I said to the Parsi capitalist, referring to the nationalist agitation for the use of made-in-India goods. Our products will be favored by the Indians on that account, was the reply. Our people will patronize home industries, and Swadeshi goods will undoubtedly be purchased in preference to imports from abroad of the same quality and price. At one time, the Tatas seemed likely to have to meet stiff competition from the big Han Ya Ping steelworks at Hankow, China. But this company has not as good ore deposits as have the Tatas, and besides, it got into difficulties. It borrowed a good deal of money from Japan, which it had to be repaid by shipments of ore and pig iron to the Japanese, who in this way got control of the only big iron and steel works in China. Japan looks to India also for some of her imports of pig iron. In a recent year, we imported from India nearly 20,000 tons of pig iron. These imports have given rise to considerable speculation as to India's future as an exporter of iron to America. She has inexhaustible supplies of cheap ore and plenty of manganese, chromium, and coal. Big native enterprises like those of the Tatas are bringing into circulation some of India's vast stores of hoarded wealth. This country has been called the sink of precious metals and the money graveyard of the world. For 25 centuries, gold and silver have been flowing into India to satisfy the craving of the people for tangible wealth to be stowed away in the earth, hidden in princely treasure vaults or turned into bracelets, anklets, and other personal adornments. There are cases where natives have died of famine rather than break into their hordes for the price of food. Records kept by the British for nearly a century show that more than $1,500 million worth of gold has gone into India above what has come out again. Since Columbus discovered America, India has absorbed one-fourth of the world's silver production, and years ago, an economist estimated the wealth locked up in the golden trinkets and silver adornments of the people of India at $2,000 million. Just think what such sums would mean if turned over to industrial undertakings. As for the capital frozen up in precious stones, there seems no way even to guess at the amount. I venture that a view of the treasures of the native princes would convince any one of the great size of the total. Among them are some of the world's most famous diamonds, and one ruler has a carpet of pearls, eight by ten feet in dimensions. Many years ago, this was valued at five million dollars. It is worth much more now. I have heard that London bullion dealers carry an assortment of beautifully polished gold bars, especially to satisfy the wants of the Indian princes. But now the Indians are showing a tendency to put their money to work for them and their country rather than to keep it hidden away. India appears to be at the beginning of a great industrial expansion, the pioneer work in which has already been done by the Tatas and other wealthy Parsis. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of From Bangkok to Bombay, Siam, French Indochina, Burma, Hindustan, by Frank G. Carpenter. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Betty B. John Bull's Biggest Police Job. Many government officials tell me that the Army is John Bull's best paying asset in India. It is kept up without taxing his people at home, and it gives him a big fighting force which he has used in South Africa, in China, in Egypt, and the Sudan, in Tibet and Afghanistan, 
and in france and the near east as well as in other parts of the world recently there were units of the indian army serving the british empire in palestine egypt mesopotamia and colonial stations these troops were however paid from the british exchequer while outside of india john bull's hold upon india is the wonder of colonial governments he has here a mixture of the most turbulent and the most peaceful peoples on earth he has some whose religion teaches them it is their duty and business to prey on and plunder their fellows and millions who have feuds with one another and who would fight to the death except for the strong arm of the british nevertheless great britain controls and protects the country with a military force averaging a little less than one soldier to each thousand people the whole army including both british and natives numbers only about three hundred thousand men the ratio between the british and the native troops is ten english to twenty-five indian soldiers one reason the british can maintain control with so few troops in such a large territory and among so many alien people is the fact that of india's three hundred and twenty millions only about twenty-five millions have today any strong warlike spirit it is from these that the indian army is chiefly recruited among them are the gurkhas the rajputs and the sikhs the marathas mountain people of the western coast the jats strict hindus and the pathans of afghanistan a pathan infantryman was the first indian to be decorated with the victoria cross which until the world war had never been granted to a native soldier some of the best of the fighters are the little gurkhas from nepal and sikkim they are on the average only five feet tall and an exception to the minimum enlistment height of five feet four inches is made in their case after the gurkhas were thoroughly beaten by the british just about the time of our war of eighteen twelve they conceived a great respect for their conquerors and enlisted in large numbers in the indian army in which they have made fine soldiers the germans have cause to remember hand-to-hand -hand trench warfare in which the gurkhas used their terrible kukris crescent-shaped razor-edged knives against the foes of great britain in contrast to the little gurkhas are the tall rajputs whose name is derived from the sanskrit for king's sons or men of royal descent they are a survival of the ancient military caste and are said to trace their ancestry back to the sun dynasty the moguls had a hard time subduing them they are fine muscular fellows with fierce mustaches turned upward and sometimes looped behind their ears among the rajput warrior princes was sir partab singh the regent of jadpur when the world war broke out he was about seventy years old yet he offered his troops and his services the viceroy urged that a man the age of the prince should stay at home but the warrior replied that he would sit on the steps of the viceregal lodge at simla refusing food and drink until he was permitted to go to france with his men convinced that the old man meant what he said and that such a performance would cause a commotion throughout india the viceroy consented and not long after sir partab singh led his lancers overseas the sikh soldiers generally stand out because they are cleanly in person and usually taller than the other indians they wear immense turbans of white or some light color some of which bear the sharp-edged steel quoit that their forefathers used to hurl at their enemies in battle the sikhs number some two millions and come from the punjab the sect was founded in the fifteenth century by a peasant religious teacher who proclaimed a pure form of hinduism denouncing both idolatry and the caste system during the next three hundred years the sikhs became a powerful military order whose fighting men regarded death on the battlefield as a passport to salvation and never showed their backs to an enemy for a time during the early days of british occupation they gave a great deal of trouble but later settled down and became the most loyal soldiers in the indian army one of the serious phases of the present unrest in india is the fact that through the trouble of amritsar 
in april nineteen nineteen the british lost the friendship of the sikhs because of some disorders in the district sir michael o'dwyer governor of the punjab obtained from the viceroy a proclamation of martial law all gatherings were forbidden suspects were imprisoned and there was generally a bad state of affairs the crowning horror occurred at emritsar the stronghold of the sikhs about two thousand men and women were gathered in a meeting in a square surrounded by tall houses when brigadier general dyer arrived with about a hundred soldiers these he posted on a ridge commanding the shut-in space and after ordering the mob to disperse told his men to shoot a fearful scene ensued and the place was strewn with wounded and corpse before general dyer gave the order to cease firing according to the official accounts three hundred and seventy-nine were killed and several times that number were wounded governor o'dwyer wired his general that he had done exactly right but later the british government censored the conduct of both men and retired them from further service still general dyer was presented with a hundred and fifty thousand dollars raised by public subscription from friends and admirers and in some quarters he was lauded as a savior and protector of the british the punjab wrongs decided gandhi to start his campaign of non-violent non-cooperation which has made john bull's police job in india so extremely difficult mohandas karamshand gandhi was born of well-to-do parents and had a university education in london his father and grandfather before him were leaders of the people and he began his career as a champion of the indians in south africa where he practiced law for a number of years when the world war broke out gandhi and his wife whom he had married when he was twelve went to london to organize an indian ambulance corps like many other leaders he hoped that in recognition of india's services to the allied cause the british would grant self-government in india as soon as the war was over when this was denied there was a burst of indignation all over india and gandhi became the leader of the agitation for swaraj or home rule the way to gain this end gandhi thought was by a policy of non-cooperation non-cooperation meant among other things giving up titles of honor and honorary offices under the british government taking no part in government loans boycotting government schools refusing to accept any military or civil post and conforming to the doctrine of swadeshi or patronage of home industry gandhi considered swadeshi the most important of all he declared that english manufacturers had ruined local industries and were draining the resources of india at the rate of more than twenty million dollars a year he reminded his fellow countrymen of how in the days of the east india company the native hand-woven cloths had competed so successfully with the british goods that in seventeen o one the sale of india's calicoes in england was forbidden by law then when the power loom and spinning jenny were invented hindustan became an importer of cotton goods and dependent on the british mills go back said gandhi to the old hand weaving crafts and wear only cloths made in india his emissaries went about setting up their looms in the marketplaces and singing the old spinning songs of india as they wove before the crowds a certain kind of cap of coarse homespun or kadar became the sign of gandhi's followers who multiplied all over the land women even wives of well-to-do indians adopted saris of kadar thousands of yards of imported cottons were burned on the docks at bombay although gandhi stood firm against violence after a time riots began to break out finally he was tried and sentenced to a term of six years imprisonment on account of ill health he was freed early in nineteen twenty four after he had served but one-third of his term during his imprisonment the non-cooperation movement waned and when he was freed though he was still the adored spiritual leader of his countrymen he was no longer their political dictator political leadership had passed to more practical men who have continued to press for swaraj or india for the indians
among the native leaders there is great dissatisfaction with the way in which the army in india is financed and managed they do not want it to be considered as a branch of the army of defense for the british empire and seek legislation to prevent its serving outside india they maintain that it should be for the protection of india alone and that moreover it should become more and more indianized as it is now british officers have all the higher positions and indian officers no matter what their age or length of service must often take orders from raw subalterns just out from home steps have been taken toward satisfying the demands of the native leaders king's commissions have been granted to a number of native officers serving in the regular indian army and indian cadets are now qualifying for commissions at the royal military college at sandhurst england at dera dun in the united province has been established the prince of wales royal indian military college a preparatory military school for a limited number of indian boys who may wish to go to sandhurst one item of army expense that the nationalists especially resent is the cost of sending the british soldiers up to the hills in the hot weather this the government maintains is absolutely essential as the british are not accustomed to the indian climate and cannot keep in good condition without this change the government also justifies its expenditure of almost half the indian budget for the maintenance of the army by pointing to the fact that nowhere else in the world is a population of three hundred and twenty millions defended at so low a cost as to what the army means to india a general whom i met at calcutta said if the british rule were removed for a week india would relapse into a state of anarchy the mohammedans would sweep down on the hindus and the gurkhas would loot and massacre the people of bengal the only salvation for india is in a strong power in control and not long ago one of the northern native chiefs said in this connection i should like to see the british leave if they did i would take half a dozen regiments and within three weeks there would not be a two anna bit left on the plains of the ganges we would loot the bengalis and capture their women i tell you it would be sport undoubtedly without the british the modern structure of trade and distribution that had been established would break down disaster and famine would follow for example if the irrigation systems port works and railroads were to become disorganized at present at any rate it looks as if the british alone were capable of handling the situation and keeping a balance between the various princes creeds and peoples i am told that the agitators do all they can to stir up sedition in the army anarchistic publications are smuggled into the native barracks and attempts are made to create dissatisfaction among the troops though the soldiers are loyal and stick to the british nevertheless they have been thinking hard since the russo-japanese war to the oriental it was a great surprise that the japanese beat the russians it was the defeat of the white man by the brown man then the question arose among the fighting classes of india if the japanese were victorious why should not the indians be too in some great war of the future yet the indian troops stood by the british in the world war to the great surprise and chagrin of the germans as a german newspaper of nineteen fifteen put it we expected that the whole of india would revolt at the first sound of the guns in europe but behold thousands and tens of thousands of indians are fighting with the british against us in addition to the army india has a large civil police every town has its local watchmen every city is patrolled by police and on the whole order is fairly well kept the watchmen are under the eyes of the headmen of their villages and major crimes are reported to the district authorities in the big towns there are police commissioners and at the stations lists are kept of released convicts suspected characters and habitual offenders such persons are carefully watched and when they move their records follow them upon such lists are the names of the descendants of the thugs and others who made crime a business the kuru marus professional thieves and pickpockets still flourish they rob houses not by entering through the doors or windows but by digging through the mud walls 
in many cases i have been told individuals employ a member of the thieves caste as a watchman holding him responsible for any theft that occurs as a rule he makes no attempt to keep awake but sleeps on the premises for he knows that it is contrary to caste rules to rob a place where one of the thieves caste is on guard the thugs have about disappeared this clan of assassins first strangled and then robbed their victims who were offered to kali their patron goddess they had maps of the country on which were indicated murder stations or places where a thug could kill with least danger of discovery they murdered by wholesale in one of the trials a certain thug confessed that he had been engaged in nine hundred assassinations the road poisoners of today are said to be the descendants of or allied to the thugs they work in small gangs following pilgrims and travelers and administering poison so that they may be able to rob one of the most common drugs used is nux vomica and another is the native datura which produces insensibility and death the latter which comes from a plant common throughout the country is one of the famous poisons of ancient india and kills without leaving trace of the cause of death poisoning has always flourished in india the legends of the gods are full of the custom and love charms and death charms may still be bought the tanners used to poison cattle for the sake of their hides by placing arsenic in their feeding troughs and within recent times an attempt was made to poison an army official with diamond dust mixed with arsenic however law and order are now better established in india than in any other country of asia with the exception of japan there are courts everywhere and every native has the right to bring suit the hindus are fond of litigation and spend freely in defending their rights something like two million civil cases are instituted each year the civil justices and the majority of the magistrates are natives and the native lawyers many of whom are graduates of the universities are both able and efficient there is a regular system of appeal courts and there are also supreme high courts from which appeals may be made to the privy council in england i have been told that two facts alone prove how well john bull has handled his police job in india one is that for more than one hundred and fifty years no conquering army has swept down through the gaps in the himalayas the other that the natives generally prefer to be tried by a british rather than an indian judge End of chapter 31。and seem to think theirs is the only nation on earth at a dinner in government house at rangoon the charming lady beside me was the daughter of an important official and from the british standpoint well educated when she learned that i was from the united states she said she knew all about our country from her brother who had just traveled through it where did he go i asked he landed in montreal and rode for days across country to vancouver that is a big city the chief place on the west of your continent when he came back he stopped in another large place called chicago he visited most of the settlements of the united states and remained a long time in one at the north i wonder if you have ever heard of it he called it minnie something you must mean minneapolis said i i think so i knew it had something to do with fruit i did not say many apples but minneapolis yes i think it was minneapolis i know the first word was minnie is it much of a place whereupon i told her that minneapolis was one of the greatest cities of the world that it was the flour barrel of john bull and that it had been feeding the english for a generation or more at this she raised her eyebrows and i could see that she did not believe me my pride received another blow the other day when i spoke to a minor official of the wealth of our great west and referred to chicago and its big banking houses 
as i started the man interrupted me by asking in a surprised way and do they have banks in chicago as a rule the british officials in the indian empire are men of fine education most of them are graduates of oxford or cambridge and many are officers of the british army the majority come from the better classes of society and some from the nobility as to things indian they are well posted and nowhere will you find a civil service with higher standards the average official certainly knows his job yet he appears abysmally ignorant of things beyond it for example one day i was talking in calcutta with a prominent britisher with a sir to his name he was speaking of the enormous irrigation schemes of the british in india and then asked me if we had irrigated lands in the united states saying he could not see why a land so well watered should need them i described the rocky mountain plateau and mentioned the vast sums we have spent on reclaiming the western deserts i referred also to irrigation in canada especially to the great undertaking at calgary where the canadian pacific railroad turned the bow river upon fifteen hundred thousand acres of arid lands and made them yield like the fertile valley of the nile upon that the britisher exclaimed indeed i thought canada was a wet country fifteen hundred thousand acres i had no idea there were any such works in the world i wonder if you are certain as to your figures i know for i have been there said i and his excellency was polite enough to pretend to believe me the english have brought with them to india their love of sports every city has its clubs and the larger places have race tracks polo grounds and golf courses native teams sometimes take part in matches especially polo which originated long ago in india and is still supported by the rajahs and other wealthy indians every big army station has its polo grounds and every officer who can afford the sport has his polo ponies horse races are run with gentlemen riding their own mounts there is plenty of cricket and football and as for hunting that is one of the chief pastimes of the british the game available includes everything from elephants and tigers to wild fowl and hare the rajahs often organize hunts for their guests and to the man properly introduced in india every sort of diversion is open during the season there are dinner parties dances and private theatricals at all army stations it seems to me that on most matters of etiquette and dress society here is even more rigid than in london everyone who gives a dinner has to be careful how the guests are seated or else those who should be last may come first i have heard of one rajah who actually fainted because he was not placed as near the head of the table as he thought he should be the members of the indian civil service and the army officers rank at the top after them come the men of big business manufacturers lawyers planters and missionaries but not the shopkeepers who are of a class by themselves the military and the civil classes are always jealous of each other and every social center is a hotbed of their rivalries the position of a family is usually governed by the office held by the man of the house in the higher positions the salaries are ample enough for one to entertain comfortably but the military men are not so well paid as the civilians still as a rule the army officers have larger clubs more fun and less formality there are two social seasons in india one in summer when every one who can possibly afford to do so goes to the highlands especially to the summer capital simla and the other in the winter the winter season is so lively that it even attracts debutantes and post debutantes of great britain there is a constant influx of young maids and old maids several hundred well-bred girls coming out every year to stay with friends or relatives these girls have good letters of introduction which help them in the pursuit of husbands many of them i understand have been unsuccessful at home and have been sent to india as a last resort some succeed in marrying and remain those who have to go back still unwed are spoken of as returned empties it is said that at the first of each season a list of these invading army of husband hunters is made up by the gossips 
Each girl is assayed, and her record, including the amount of her fortune, if any, is examined. All this information is set down and secretly passed around to the bachelors of the military and civilian sets. Among the social features of every winner are the masked and fancy dress balls. I attended one such ball held at Government House in Calcutta. It seemed as if all the characters of the world had stepped from the pages of history and were going mad in the dance. I noticed a convict in chains gliding across the floor with the somber gowned sister of charity. There was old Mother Goose with her broom and cocked hat, arm in arm with a silk clad Chinese mandarin. One girl was decked out as a carrier pigeon in a dress made of iridescent feathers. Another was labeled dressed in China, and a third was Galatia. One woman, covered with native newspapers, represented the press, and editorials about the prevalent unrest could be read on her back. And then there were Burmese noblemen, Japanese daimyos, and priests of every religion. As I walked through the crowd, observing the fresh rosy faces of the English girls, I asked how they were able to keep their color out here in the tropics. The reply was, oh, they spend nine months of the year in the Himalayas and come to Calcutta only during the winter. Some of them go home every few years, leaving us men here to work. I assure you, India is not a bad place for a woman if she has an easy-going husband and money to spend. They tell me that marriage is an expensive luxury in India, especially in the cities. House rents in Calcutta are high. An establishment of 10 or 12 rooms in a good location costing about $400 a month. A small apartment of six rooms rents for $150. Fashionable couples must entertain a good deal, and every wife must have her long summer vacation at Darjeeling, Simla, or some other hill station. Keeping house in India seems cheap until you understand the conditions. Servants get almost nothing in comparison with domestics in the United States. One can hire fair cooks for $10 a month and housemen for seven. The trouble is that mainly because of the caste rules, the Englishman has to employ a dozen servants in India where he needs one at home. The man who serves at the table will not wash the dishes. The man who washes the dishes will not make the beds. He who makes the beds will not sweep the floor or bring water, while the one who brings clean water will under no circumstances carry out the dirty water. The cook will not clean the pots and pans, and so it goes. If you keep horses, you must have a groom to each animal and a man to cut grass for every two mounts. Every child must have its own nurse. The servants are nearly all men, the women acting only as ladies' maids and sometimes as nurses. As to food, it is expensive when the quality is considered. Meats are invariably poor, and the fowl generally tastes like frayed rope. Eggs are occasionally fresh, although little larger than the big white alleys with which I used to play marbles. The ordinary meals here are tea, bread, and butter upon rising, which is called chota hazri, or little breakfast. There is a second breakfast at about 10 o'clock, luncheon comes between 2 and 3, and dinner along about 8. Late in the afternoon, everyone takes his carriage or motor and goes driving, stopping at the clubs to listen to the music, to meet friends and have tea. One of the big items of expense in India is the commission one must pay on all he buys. The 10% rake-off demanded by servants often comes to more than their wages. If you order a cab, your servant wants his commission, and if the cabman takes you to a native merchant, he expects to get his percentage on what you purchase. The merchant makes his prices accordingly. The cook gets a commission on all the food that comes into the house, and the hostlers feed fat on your grass, corn, and oats. It is the same with the butler. He gets his tip from every native who calls upon you, and if your major domo is not, feed your caller may cool his heels indefinitely and you will not get his card. In this connection, I talked the other day with a British commissioner in one of the most important Indian provinces. Said he, my very doorkeeper makes money off my official callers. 
when a native appears and asks to see the commissioner the doorkeeper will say that the sahib is busy the native knows what he means and he will drop eight anas or a rupee into his hand he is then introduced to the chief clerk and he may have to pay five rupees more before he gets farther if he does not offer to pay he will probably be told to call around tomorrow and it may be days before he can get in to see me we know what goes on but cannot prevent it very few natives are admitted to the circles of british society the average englishman regards the indian as an inferior and will not allow him to be a member of his club or to come to his house as a guest this is especially true of the middle-class british business men for the officials must not let their feeling of superiority become apparent not even parsees may become members of the bombay yacht club one of the finest clubs in the british empire it admits no indians not even highly educated rajahs and in fact i understand that no indian has ever been invited inside its big cool rooms it was the extreme exclusiveness of this club which is naturally somewhat offensive to leading indians that led lord willingdon a recent governor of bombay to found the willingdon club in this parsees hindus and moslems as well as englishmen are eligible for membership the british say that they are not wholly to blame for the social barriers between them and the upper class indians with few exceptions the well-born indian ladies are purda and hence have no social contacts with men other than their husbands and members of their families furthermore the indians have as a rule such a poor opinion of women generally that the westerner does not care to expose members of his family to their contempt again while a high caste hindu may play bridge all night with a party of englishmen he hesitates to eat at the same table with them and if he does so usually performs ceremonial ablutions to make up for having broken the rules of his caste the anglo-indians or half-breed offspring of indians and europeans form a social class by themselves many are half portuguese others half french and others half british there are also indian mulattoes and octoroons but whatever the mixture of blood it is considered a disgrace by both native and foreigner and such persons are not received in either british or indian society there are about two hundred thousand anglo-indians many of whom are clerks some go into trade and make money and now and then one rises to distinction but always they flock by themselves having their own society with customs patterned after those of the british end of chapter thirty two end of from bangkok to bombay siam french indochina burma hindustan by frank g carpenter